Looking back over my designs, I've done single motorcraft, I've done a lot of work on twin motorcraft. I've even done a three motorcraft, which I call triple motor on the basis it's got three motors, so it was two for lift, one for thrust. So an idea I had for a while to do a four motorcraft, and here it is. Now your first thought is, that looks a lot like a motor rotor in a box, just put a pin in that thought, we'll come back to it. This is my standard construction, it's basically just, it's almost a mirrored version of the twin motor one. I've given it a very brief test and one thing I mentioned in my build log was the first test of these things doesn't tend to be pretty and it didn't help that it was quite a windy night and you really need dead calm. So I've got some video of it just kind of bouncing around and not quite working as good as it will be when it's tweaked but it proves the concept and it especially proves this thing has a ludicrous hover height if it can be stabilised but it very often topples off the air cushion like here and part of this video is what can I do about this rather than just pointing it out. So the question of is this just a multi rotor in a box, well let me ask a question. What can a multi-rotor do when it has a thrust to weight of 0 0.5? It's not a trick question. It can't do anything. So this thing can do some useful things with a thrust to weight of 0 0.5. Therefore, it's arguably not quite as simple as a multi-rotor in a box. So a multi-rotor can't do anything with a thrust to weight of 0 0.5 other than sit there burning up batteries. Or I guess if you dropped it off a cliff, it would fall somewhat slower than if it wasn't powered at all. But in terms of serious answers, multi rotor can't do anything with a thrust away of 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or 0 0.4, even 0 0.9. Yeah. I've observed a very weak ground effect in multi rotors, but it's not really stable or usable, and it's something you want to get away from as quickly as possible. Just going to awkwardly interject this dialogue that now that I've done a bit of testing with the little quadcopter, I'm a little bit less confident about what I just said, that it's not usable at all until thrust to weight 1. Certainly at 0.5, nothing. 0.7, very weak ground effect, but it's bounce, 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 and it really can't move, you can't tilt far enough to actually do anything. At thrust weight 0.85 to 0.95, there is ground effect, absolutely in the multi-rotor. I'm not trying to declare there isn't any, it's just... But by the time you reach that thrust to weight, it's only a little bit more thrust to weight to actually leave ground effect completely. But I'll leave this in, and it's definitely something that I'll be coming back to, especially when I scale up my little testing quad to use the same motors, propellers and batteries as the hovercraft. For the sake of the comparison I'm about to do, I'm going to declare that multi rotor is completely useless until thrust weight of about 0.85, and that's where there's clear ground effect, and at least the thing can move and turn without bouncing off the ground the entire time. And at thrust weight of about 1, it can just sit on the edge of ground effect, but again, it's not very stable. And it takes thrust to weight above 1, strangely enough, to actually definitively leave ground effect. And once that's done, then the quad can fly as high as it wants up to the limits of the battery. One question I have been asked, and it's been in my head for a while as well, is what is the thrust to weight of these hovercraft? Do they produce less thrust than their weight? Or are they just glorified multi-rotor in a box? If these hovercraft did only produce the same amount of thrust as their weight, it would imply the only thing the ground is really doing is just acting as a stabiliser. Because every single thing I've built so far has been no, there's been no artificial stability, there's been no gyros, there's been no flight stabilizers, there's been no flight controllers. It's stabilized through the ground cushion. But the question is, is it lifting through the ground cushion as such? So to actually investigate this question is a little bit more difficult than I initially thought because the first thing I thought to do was, okay, measure power versus hover height, which doesn't sound that complicated, but I got into it and was like, hmm, it's something I will be covering in future videos, but to get some sort of starting point on some data, 
I took the design I had sitting around at the time, which was two motor square hovercraft, which is a slightly unusual design and it's got some interesting quirks, but again that will be covered in a, another video. And I very quickly discovered if you want to measure the hover height, for example by putting a ruler up against it, you need a way of restraining the hovercraft in place. And also because one of the questions that I'm trying to investigate here is, is my hover height limited by power or by stability? In other words, if I could make it more stable, would it hover higher? And either way, you need a way to restrain it in place but without actual effect in the hover height, which is more difficult than it first seems. I built a, I call it a kind of testing rail, which I'll put a picture of up. It's just as a starting point to allow me to get some sort of measurements. So without further ado, here it is. Here is power versus lift height on this particular hovercraft. Now, when I've been running these experiments, I've been using external power from a server power supply just so I'm not having to constantly swap batteries in and out. And one big advantage of the server power supply is it will maintain its own voltage under load. However, it does mean that maximum power using the server power supply is actually a bit higher than what can be achieved on the battery. And I've indicated that there with the orange line. Maximum power measured with a battery is about 280 watts. Sure, you might see above 300 with a fresh battery initially, but it settles down to be realistically about 280 watts. And even then, I tended to run just a little bit below maximum power. I'd say my typical maximum would be around about 240, 250, which I've also highlighted. Only use the absolute maximum lift power when needed. So it's an interesting curve and I'll definitely need to refine my kind of measurement methods a bit. And that kind of wobbling is the hover instability beginning to creep in. That's where this craft can momentarily achieve an air gap of 180 millimetres, but it's very fleeting as the thing kind of wobbles back and forth. So that's like the kind of highest point above the ground technically is 180 millimetres. But that's only really achievable with the external power. So I'm happy to call 120 millimetres the actual maximum hover height. And two words here, hard surface. This is all done on a hard surface and something you might have noticed in my videos and if anybody that's managed to build one of these things, it hovers higher over grass, like a lot higher. And in fact, you're going to get pretty much the worst hover height on a hard surface. Any sort of, I don't know if there's a better word for this, but a puffy surface, like blades of grass or, you know, leaves, even just dirt. It, it just seems anything other than a, a perfectly hard surface gives a better air cushion. And I could very easily rerun this on grass at some point with my new testing rig, which I'll be showing off. But for now, we're keeping it on a hard surface for consistency. The next thing I measured was the open air thrust of the motors, or more like I took one motor and put it on my thrust measuring stand because it could only accommodate one motor, ran the test and then doubled the results. It's not perfect because, you know, it's going to be two motors versus one, but it's not necessarily a completely linear thing because the voltage might drop a bit further and blah blah blah, but as an indication, this is basically fine. And again, maximum power under a battery is going to be just under 300 watts, but I thought might as well just run the thing up to maximum anyway. The final thing is the weight of the two motor square craft, which is around about 1200 grams. I don't recall measuring it when I actually had it built, so I kind of roughly put it back together and it's in that region, so I'm just going to say 1250. The hull alone is about 550. You know, batteries, 200 motors or 100 each, add some for ESCs, servos, etc. So I'm just going to run with 1250. So what we can do now is work out the thrust to weight of two motor hover square. So for example, at 100 watts, the open air thrust is about 700 grams. Being that the craft weighs 1250, your thrust to weight is around about 0.6 in that ballpark, so at least at that height we can say it is in fact producing less thrust than its weight, so the ground isn't just a stabiliser. There is actually an advantage to this, and the motor rotor at thrust to weight of 0.6 isn't doing anything. So from there, since these curves are following quite neat equations, can simply carry on that process for each data point. So the most direct way is simply thrust to weight against height, which is here. And again, that 
kind of wobble at about 100 to 120 millimetres, that's when it was destabilising, and that's also basically the limit of the height you're going to get on a battery. That kind of nice straight run up to 180 millimetres, that was only happening on the external power supply in the rail. So I tend to think of truncating this at about 120 millimetres, but there's the whole thing for the measurements that I did. So quite simply, up to that maximum hover height, most of the time it does have a thrust to weight less than one. So there's your answer. And by some strange coincidence, just as it reaches thrust to weight of one and above is where the stability problems seem to start. So that's one way of looking at it, and keep this graph in mind. Something else I did. I did the weight of the craft divided by the open air thrust for each data point, and this looks like this. You could also call this kind of strength of ground effect, but I'm calling it a thrust multiplier. Looking at 35 millimetres, it's producing about 450 grams of open air thrust, and the thing weighs 1250 grams, so it's as if that thrust has been multiplied about 2.8 times. I don't know if that's really the best way to look at it, but whatever way you look at it, those motors are only producing about a third of, in the open air, they're producing about a third of the thing's weight. Yet in hovering on the spot, the total upward force must be equal to the weight. So, I wanted to call it coefficient of thrust, but I think that's probably a bit of a already used term, so I'm calling it thrust multiplier just now, unless anybody's got a better suggestion. But it certainly shows just how rapidly it falls away with height, what I'd expect. But again, it doesn't reach 1 until 100 millimeters, and it's only at 120 millimeters, which is about the maximum you're going to get on a battery, that it's producing more thrust than its weight. So at that point, it's definitely less efficient than a multirotor. So the final conclusion is that at some point, it's better to vent thrust directly down rather than trying to run it through the hovercraft with the peripheral jet. We'll come back to that idea. So what I've done now is I've overlaid the thrust to weight curve onto this graph with the one with the multirotor. Now obviously that multirotor one's just going to shoot off to you know a kilometre or whatever, but this is a range I'm kind of interested in. I'm jumping back to this graph now just because it's easier to work with. So that's thrust to weight curve of a multirotor and I've marked on 100 millimetres which is, of course, where the thrust to weight of the two-motor square craft reaches one, or thereabouts. I think I've drawn it slightly off, but whatever. It's an indication. So the blue shaded region is exactly where this hovercraft would actually have an advantage over multirotor, and within this region, not only can it hover within that range while it's hovering, it can move and it can turn. And to come back to an earlier point, a multi-rotor not only needs to get its thrust to weight above 1, it needs to be somewhat above 1 in order to have any sort of thrust left in order to turn or yaw or do all at once. So I'm happy to say we've got this region where this hovercraft is not, in fact, just a multi-rotor in a box. That's quite a bit of work to get to this conclusion, and there's more to do. Now, obviously, the hovercraft is stuck down at that 180 millimetres or in that region no matter what now. So, we're not just stopping here. What I want to do is a craft that can do this. Knowing what I know now, I am working to a hovercraft that not only is more efficient within that ground effect region, but it can essentially turn itself into a multirotor and leave ground effect completely if needed. And the analogy to a ground effect vehicle being this ground effect multirotor will be more efficient in the ground effect range, but if needed, at least the option is there to leave it. And like a ground effect vehicle that might be flying out of ground effect, not going to be as efficient as a multirotor in the free air, definitely not with the weight and drag of the hull. But likewise, a multirotor with a thrust to weight of 0.5 isn't very efficient because it can't move. So that's where I'm going. And the next thing to talk about is how I'm going to achieve that, or how I hope I'm going to achieve it. One quick thing, so the data I've showed so far has been for the two motor square craft, but the four motor craft that, you know, I actually started this video with. Ground effect for an aircraft typically really begins at half a wingspan above the ground, and the kind of limit is usually taken to be about one wingspan above the ground. Maybe one and a half if you're being very generous. 
But in the context of my four motor craft being a metre across, I think the curve may look like this. I want a design that can get every last bit of ground effect working for it. So there will be a much larger range where the ground effect is an advantage even over a normal multirotor, but equally it can leave ground effect if needed. As to how I'm going to achieve this, well, here's my next thoughts. Practically speaking, I need to control the split of airflow between hovercraft and direct thrust, which is partly already done for me. I kind of wish I'd pointed this out at the start. These holes under the propellers, those are stabilisation ports, and the answer to what they do is stabilise. The answer to how do they do it is very well, basically. But yeah, a pure peripheral jet craft isn't stable. You need to get some amount of air underneath the hull, and that's just a really simple way of doing it. Again, I've got a video about stability ports coming, hopefully not too far off. So the basic peripheral jet design is venting a small amount of air directly down anyway. Now, it reaches the ground and spreads out and a bunch of stuff happens under here, which is very difficult to visualise. I've tried using a smoke machine to do it. I'll put the video up, but it is very difficult to get smoke to show up well in video, even in the high-speed video, even in a dark room, even with me trying different lighting. I'm going to carry on with that, maybe try thicker smoke, but for now, know that the flow under here is quite complicated, but the basic idea of the split between the peripheral jet and the stability jet, that split is already a part of the current design. So the answer is already there, just enlarge the stability port. If you made the stability port the same diameter as a propeller, that propeller wash is going straight down. It'll just be path of least resistance. None of it's going to the peripheral jet if it can just go straight down. In fact, it might even pull a little bit of air in through the peripheral jet because you know, directly behind the propeller slipstream is actually a little bit of suction you may find. So that implies this design. I've been spending some time learning my animation. I I'm getting there. I'm looking at two regions of airflow, blue being the peripheral jet and red being the stability jet. And this is drawn kind of simplified just for the sake of animation. And also it's drawn as just looking along, you know, a kind of single motor craft again, just for simplicity's sake. So just imagine it mirrored out to four motors. The first region that I can kind of identify as what I'm going to call low ground effect, which is where these hovercraft tend to operate anyway. So in this mode, the propeller stability port cut out is 50% of the propeller diameter, and most of the air is going to the peripheral jet, which makes sense because you're close to the ground, you want to contain that airflow. Within this region, it's passively stable. We don't need any sort of artificial stability or a flight controller. It just works, and it can be propelled and turned just using the flow from the control flaps. So if I imagine opening up that stability port as power increases, more of the thrust is going to be coming straight out of that port, and it's going to rise up to a point where the peripheral jet is diminishing, but not gone. Now, I don't know exactly what sort of split I need here. It may be stability port only needs to be slightly larger to get into this zone, bearing in mind it's a area which you know, varies with diameter squared. But the way I've drawn it is an indication a lot of air is going down through that port, but we've still got a bit in the peripheral jet. I think this will need stabilisation. I think this is where a flight controller is going to become needed. I think this is the exact point where that, that momentary very high hover height before it collapsed off the cushion, that's where I want this zone to be. Just right up at the edge of ground effect, still feeling a little bit of air cushion, but not quite flying free. Finally, if you open up the stability port completely to the propeller diameter, this is now a multi-rotor in a box, like, for, I know I keep saying it, but genuinely, that hull isn't actually doing anything now. Well, it's adding a bit of weight and drag, it might also add a bit of damping, and I might have an idea swirling about. Well, it's basically a big plate, and a big plate makes a nice wing. So could we start adding outboard wings and horizontal stabilizers onto this and make some sort of hovercraft multi-rotor VTOL weird flying plane hybrid? I've got a few ideas brewing.
So that's the three regions from kind of low to mid ground effects is where my designs operate currently to this briefly achievable but not stable high ground effect and then finally transitioning to just pure multi-rotor. The thing I'm really interested in is where does the flight stabiliser become necessary? You know, it's definitely needed out of ground effect and it's definitely not needed low to the ground. So where exactly does that transition happen? That would be an interesting topic. Another interesting topic is how mechanically to achieve this. Now, the way I've drawn it, it implies an iris mechanism. Just open up the stability ports like so. But the difference between nice pretty animation and CAD and something that can be built easily it can be pretty big, I've learned. It's not how to make an iris mechanism. I've got a 3D printer, I'm sure I can design something that's how to make an iris mechanism that isn't incredibly heavy, fragile, prone to binding up, etc. It certainly has the advantage of being very proportional. You know, you open up the iris, it really is just enlarging that area. I have a few other ideas swirling, which will be in the next video. I'm going to start testing some of them. But certainly the idea of controlling that airflow between the peripheral jet and stability jet is what's important here, and the idea that stability jet eventually just becomes the jet, it just becomes a multi-rotor. So I think this video has dragged on a little bit more than I really would have liked. And I'm still going to call them multi-rotors and not drones.